thanks for coming. We'll have, I think, a great morning together. I'm Daniel McNulty, the director of the Patents Project, here with Marcy Wilburn, coordinator for the IER, IEPRC project. And we're going to talk about designing instruction to support all learners through specially designed instruction and universal design for learning and some other things. So if you're not familiar with the Patents Project, I'm the director of the Patents Project. We've been around a long time. Uh, started as an assistive technology project, moved into uh, doing universal design for learning through a universal design for learning pilot program in the state from 2002 to about 2009-ish. And uh, the first three years of that project, I was actually a teacher in the classroom at one of those first co cohorts of UDL pilot schools. So I've seen universal design for learning from the teacher perspective, as well as from an assistive technology coordinator perspective, and, and, and then now from the director of patents perspective for about uh, 20 years. And I'll tell you a little bit more about myself later, but patents is a free resource to K-12 public uh, schools in Indiana, and our mission is to support Indiana public schools to create and sustain an equitable learning environment for every student. And we attack that through three primary lenses. One is universal design for learning, two is assistive technology, and three is accessible educational materials. So we are also the Indiana Center for Accessible Materials, or the ICAM, which is where all those accessible educational materials, or AIM, come from. And so when you get the slides, those three, um, those three lenses there are hot links, and you can click those and go to those three spots on our website. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the services and things that we can offer, but I just want you to know that they're all at no cost to Indiana Public K-12 schools, with one exception, which is our conference coming up in a couple weeks on November 16th, 17th, and 18th, um, that we just charge a minimal fee for to bring in some of the best national and international presenters and state presenters uh, from around um, the country and the state. And uh, it's all implementation, that conference. It's no vendors, there's no vendor biases that come in. It's all people who are making things work in classrooms. So, and it's all, it's all uh, virtual this year. So you can attend from anywhere. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that is patents. So I've told you a little bit about myself and I'll tell you a little bit more. So I've been in education, primarily special education for the past 22 years, I guess, or so. I uh, started out as a engineering major at Purdue and decided I couldn't work with engineers for the rest of my life. And what I was really enjoying and doing for fun uh, on the weekends and, and for work was, was with kids. And it was, I was a camp counselor and I worked with big brothers, big sisters, and I worked as a paraprofessional and I thought, man, I should probably just do this. <laughs> so I did and started a behavioral consulting business for young kids on the autism spectrum. Uh, worked in a, as a classroom teacher in moderate, moderate and severe disabilities uh, in Brixton, Indiana for kindergarten through sixth graders. And, and like I said, became the UDL uh, pilot school leader for that school and the autism team and tech team and crisis teams. And But basically my undergrad and graduate degrees are both in uh, intense intervention, special education. But I really want you to know about me is, is the first bullet point on this slide. I was a form, I'm a former anti-technology teacher and parent. I didn't want a computer in my classroom. I didn't want a computer in my home. And I was dead serious about that. And I, I looking back, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the big reasons was I think just um, overconfidence or arrogance, if you will, in my own abilities to understand and change behavior and to, and to teach. And I thought, I don't need special help from a technology and this and that. I, I can do it. I got this. Looking back now, I make a point of telling that story because um, that was pretty foolish and silly of me. And I know you probably work with folks who are along those same lines. Like I, I don't, didn't grow up with this stuff. I don't understand how to do these things. I'm confident in my abilities. I don't need technology to help me out. Uh, but what I've seen is that technology not only helps students who absolutely need it as a required assistive tech in, the, in their IEP, for example, but it helps all of us in a lot of different ways, uh, including me. And so I've clearly changed my mind now being the director of an assistive tech project. Um, but I think that's an important story to tell because um, even if you don't like technology or don't want it in your personal life necessarily, what I like to tell teachers is it's really not about you at all. And I'm sorry if that sounds a little harsh, but it's about your learners. And so what I've seen happen over time and, and absolutely as a classroom teacher is that 
the stuff that I didn't want in my classroom, I tried and saw students be able to show me things that they were able to do and learn and demonstrate that they would simply not be able to do without those tools. Um, and that's just grown as I've, as I've gotten older and, and moved forward in my career and um, both personally and professionally, everything is sort of mixed. And um, I've seen people be able to do a lot of things they couldn't do without tools. So it's okay if you don't like the tool, if you don't like technology, just keep in mind that that part of it is, is really not about you. It's about your students being able to show you what they're able to do. So that's me for fun. I have four cats and we were just playing fetch before you guys came on with one of them <laughs> and uh, live with four cats and my wife. And we've got three kids who are all in college now, which is awesome. And I try to go as fast and far on two wheels as I possibly can and scuba dive with sharks whenever I can. All right. So now we'll jump into what is the Indian IEP Resource Center. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, our mission and our goal is very similar to that of the Patents Project. So we are really here to increase the knowledge, skills, and capacity of Indiana educators to really improve outcomes for students with disabilities. And we also do that in three ways. We provide technical assistance, both to districts and schools, where we go in and have building level leadership team meetings, district level leadership team meetings to really talk about what is education looking like in your school, not just for students with disabilities, but for all kids. And we review that data with them and have conversations about this is what's going well. And these are some opportunities for growth within our system. We also provide training similar to what we're doing today. We have virtual training, face-to-face -face training. We also have statewide conferences, um, just like Daniel's conference, very similar. Um, and those are the only events that we charge for as well as when we're bringing in those national, international people to come present to you. And when we're utilizing a venue where we have to pay a little bit more for that and for the food and those types of things. So those are the things that we charge for, but all of our TA training, technical assistance and dissemination that we're providing across the state, those are all no charge and offered to you. And Daniel's talking about that environment and equity within the environment. And we're talking about equity and access within that core curriculum as well, really looking at high quality instruction to benefit all students. Um, speaking of really quickly, let's just talk about some logistical things. Um, if your preference is closed captioning, closed captions are available. Um, you can click in the lower toolbar to turn those on. Um, we are in the platform of Zoom webinar. So all cameras are off for everyone. You don't have the ability to mute and unmute your mic, but please go ahead and comment via the chat or the Q&A. Um, Daniel and I definitely wanna make sure that this session meets your needs. So please feel free to communicate with us throughout the session in those two forums, even though you're unable to mute and unmute within webinar platform. All right, a little bit more about me. I am Marcy Wilburn. Like Daniel said, I'm the project coordinator for the Indian IEP Resource Center. And I actually got my undergrad degree from Indiana State University. I have a mild interventions license K-12, a general education license K-6, and a math concentration at the middle school level. I got my graduate master's degree from Ball State University in applied behavior analysis. And then I am a dissertation away from my doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Indiana State University. I've been with the Resource Center for about six years now, um, really providing this instruction throughout that time. Um, a little bit about my personal life is I have two crazy kiddos, identical twin boys who are in kindergarten this year. Um, that is the best picture you can get when they're three and a half when you are trying to get a good family picture with two little crazy boys. Um, I love going on vacation, all things traveling and you can win me over with chocolate and Diet Coke. So if you ever meet me in person, those are the ways to get my attention and we can become best friends over some chocolate and Diet Coke. All right. So we wanna know a little bit about you today. So go ahead and you can access menti.com in two different ways. You can type in your web browser, www.menti.com and enter this eight digit code or for faster access, you can pick up your phone open the camera and simply scan over the QR code and it will take you right there. We will be utilizing Minty throughout the session today. Um, so if you're having difficulty, please feel free to reach out via the chat and we wanna help you because this is not the only time that we're gonna use it. So let's make sure that you're successful in being able to access this. Um, while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of the slides and pull up Minty so we can kind of see who's here today. All right, we have three people so far who have already answered. We have some special education teachers. 
looks like some others. All right, so for you others who keep coming up, if you don't mind, go ahead and typing your other within the chat, and letting us know who you are. I know just from looking at the participant list, we have some Indian IEP Resource Center consultants who are new to our staff. We have Rachel from the Department of Education on. Nice, project coordinators, TA specialists, behavior specialists, welcome, thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. We hope you find this time beneficial. Right. I'm Minty, there we go. So our learning objectives for today um, and really, most of them are covered within the title, but to get a little bit more explicit in what we're going to cover, we really want participants to gain knowledge and understanding on the considerations for providing equitable access to high quality tier one instruction for all students using universal design for learning. So this isn't just about students with disabilities. This isn't just about students who are at risk. This is how we can prove instruction for everyone. And then within that, we're going to talk about now that we're doing this for everybody, what do we specifically have to do to ensure that students with disabilities are getting what they need to progress towards their educational goals? And that's that specially designed instruction piece. What makes special education special? So we're going to talk about that as well today. We have some stuff to get us to our learning objectives. So let's go ahead and look at what we have for you today. There is a Padlet available to you. So um, you can access that just by simply um, clicking on this hyperlink when you get the slides, or you can type that into your UR or your browser as well. I am going to show you what that looks like and talk through a little bit about that with you. So you have the slides within the Padlet. You also have resources specific to universal design for learning. You have resources specific to specially designed instruction, and you have some additional resources on accommodations and modifications. Um, the best thing about Padlet is that you can continually add resources over time to this. So if after this presentation, you know, Daniel stumbles upon something that you're like, oh, I would really like access to that. And he's talking about it. We can add it here and everyone can have access after the fact. So it is live and it will change over time as we add materials. So this is the start. But if there's other things that, you know, think would be beneficial to you or come up in the conversation today, we'll definitely add those as well. So please feel free to access the Padlet to get the resources today. All right, we're gonna kick it off with all means all. I covered it a little bit that we're talking about how we can improve that first best instruction for all of our learners. And this is our reality right now. We have students of varying levels and abilities, varying interests, varying hobbies, Things that make up individuals as a person, not just our students, but our educators as well. Everyone has their strengths. Everyone has their opportunities to grow. But how do we meet the needs of classes that look like this? We want students to be included. We know that inclusive education research tells us that's what's successful for students with disabilities and for students without disabilities. But when our classes look like this, it can be overwhelming if we're not planning for the students that we're serving. So let's talk about that today and get into this reality. How do we make it work within a classroom setting so that all students can meet their goals and improve outcomes? So first focusing on this high or this whole child approach that we have. At the bottom, I know many of you are familiar with the triangle through response to intervention, RTI, multi-tiered system of support, MTSS. And when we're looking here, we want that universal instruction, that bottom core, to, to meet the needs of 80% of our students. And then it's an additive model. So when we move up to the targeted layer, that yellow area, we're talking about 10 to 15% of our students who might need some added support. It is not in place of, it is additional supports that students need. So they still have access to the core and then we pr provide additional supports to them as well. And then that tip of the iceberg, that triangle there, we have about five to 10% of our students at that top who need even more intensified support. So they might receive that universal 
some targeted su supports, and then even more intensified supports in order to be successful. So when we're looking at this triangle, oftentimes students get stuck in one of these tiers. So maybe they need reading support. So they become a tier two student in reading and they're stuck in that middle ground. And really when we're talking about this triangle, students aren't labeled by the tier that they're in. They are students who need additional support with reading and maybe even a specific skill area within reading where it should be fluid where they're moving in and out because our students aren't always not good at reading in general, it's specific skills that they have deficits in. So let's think of it more along the lines of this. We all have our strengths and we all have our areas of need. We were talking yesterday at lunch about retirement plans and insurance. And I'm more at the tip of the triangle when we're talking about that. I need some support to figure out what to do and what's best for me in that. I don't have those skills independently. But when we're talking about um, providing trainings in universal design for learning, and when we're talking about providing trainings and how to best meet the needs of all learners within our classroom, I'm at that bottom tier. I don't need as much support. I love having Daniel present alongside me, but it's something that I can do independent of Daniel as well. So when we're looking at us as individuals, we all have our strengths. We all have areas within that green. And then we all have areas within the yellow category where we need some support or even the red category where we need more in intensified services and supports. So think about yourself and what skills that you have that fall in these different categories. And also consider your students and where they fall and that they're not a tier three student or a tier two student. They're students who need additional supports at a certain point in time, and we can back off those supports when they're no longer needed and bring them back on if they're needed again, but it should be more of that fluid approach where we're meeting all the needs of students. And we're meeting the needs academically, we're meeting the needs behaviorally, and we're meeting the needs social emotionally. And what does that look like for students? So really change, that idea of support and intervention for that student at all times, but think of it, how can we provide it when it's needed and back off when it's not, assuming that all students get access to good tier one instruction and we're adding on support over time when they're needed. Because there really is this false dichotomy. When we look back at that original circle with all the different colored dots, everybody brings in strengths and everybody brings in needs. We have a little boy, let's call him Johnny, on the left-hand side of the screen, and he's a student with a disability. He receives services that are within his IEP, and we are legally mandated to provide Johnny those services. Then we have, let's say, Sammy on the right side of the screen, who also struggles with reading, very similar to Johnny, yet he doesn't qualify for services. We don't have the legal obligation with Sammy. We don't have the IEP. We don't have that documentation that if we don't provide it, we could potentially end up in due process, but we have a moral obligation to serve Sammy. So they have different status, but they have the same need. And how are we going to best serve both of these students? Think about the best people, within your system who can serve both of these students who struggle with reading, regardless of their status. Think about utilizing the time of staff and how do we rethink the way we're using our resources within our systems. And we don't have walls between special ed and gen ed and title one and ELL, but we're breaking down those walls to best serve all of the individuals within our building and really creating that sense of shared responsibility for everyone. So, even though these students have a different status, they have the same need and we can work more efficiently to serve their needs. So again, students with disabilities don't have special needs, they have special rights, but we need to serve all students. All right, Daniel. Yeah, so that's a really important slide. I like that slide a lot, Marcy, that students with special, with special education with an IEP don't necessarily have special needs, they have special rights. And I think sometimes we in schools look at the extra things or the or the, the more difficult things we have to do as 
um, to meet the needs of some learners as a barrier, as a problem. And what I really love about universal design for learning is that it sort of flips that on its, on its head a little bit. And instead of looking at a child or a student or a learner as the problem, we start to look at the curriculum and the environment and the strategies as the problem. So we stop trying to fix the child and we start trying to fix the surroundings, the environment, the curriculum, um, which is just a different way of thinking and looking at things. Uh, you can go ahead. So how do we how do we meet the needs of all learners then? And so I've thought I've thought about this a lot mm -hmm. in a lot of different places in a lot of different ways. Um, and it really comes down to me boiling it down to this one statement. And with, within this one statement, there's, there's enough to talk about for a week, but it comes down to this, this really this one question, are you willing, permitted, and able to teach differently, not just teach with different tools? And so I think, especially as the director of a, a, a technology project, it's important for me to say that, that it's not about the tools necessarily. Or, or the tools should be the last thing considered is another way to put that. And so if we break this down a little bit, the willing part has to do with attitude, which has to do with people, which is culture. And it has to do with changing the culture of a place. Um, the permitted part has to do with policies and procedures that, that are on file at a, at a school corporation, for example. And I used to be long, long, long time ago of the opinion that, hey, just do what's right. It doesn't matter what the policy says. And I, you know, looking back now, 20 years later, I realized that was a really irresponsible way of thinking, but not just irresponsible. It was also uh, ineffective. And so what changed my mind about that was I was called in to do a training on iPads by a whole school district right when iPads first came out. So I happened to be presenting at uh, on a panel in at a conference in Florida, and I got an email from a northern Indiana school that said, hey, we just bought 88 iPads for all of our staff. And literally like the day before the iPad was just announced. So this was like in 2009, I think. Um, and they said, can you come in in July? and train all of our staff on iPads. And I'm like, are you kidding? I just, I just heard the word for the first time yesterday. I don't even know what it looks like. I haven't got my hands on it. And I said, of course, I'll come train your whole staff in July. So that was in January. Between January and July, I got my hands on the iPad, figured it out, came in to train them. And above the doorway uh, to this training room, there was two signs. One said, we have a 95% attendance rate, which I thought, all right, that's cool. The other sign said, no devices. And it had a big circle with a line through it. And in the circle, it listed all of the devices that were not allowed. And at the top of the list was iPad. So I thought, oh, hang on, this is, a, this is an issue. And I uh, mentally, and then I thought, no, I, I can't keep this just mentally. I've got to say this to somebody. So I said, guys, I think we have a problem here. Somebody in your district was making it a priority to give every teacher here an iPad most of them I'm looking at are still in their box, still wrapped in plastic, they haven't even been opened yet. And somebody else in the same district was making a policy that said no iPads. And I mm -hmm. said, oh yeah, that's for kids, it's not for teachers. And, this, and I said, well, the problem is that that sign outside this door gives all the people in this room that still have their iPads boxed up and in plastic permission to maintain that attitude that they don't wanna use it and they don't wanna change things. And so the policies that are on file and, and the protocols that are in place either encourage creativity or they discourage creativity. There's no middle ground, it's one or the other. So that's the permitted part of this. The able part of this has to do with your skills, which is easy to fix, that's why you're here. We offer so many trainings, IEPRC offers so many trainings, the other earns. Uh, you can go on YouTube and Google and find stuff. The skills parts of this is, is pretty easy to fix. I know finding the time to do it's a different story, but it's about that middle section to teach differently, not just with different tools. So if I take my phone or my iPad and I take a picture of the paper worksheet I've used for 10 years, and then I send that to a kid's iPad, that's not teaching differently. That's using the same thing I've done for 10 years and now doing it on a different tool. Doesn't change practice, doesn't change outcomes. So we've got to look at the student, and the environment, the specific tasks we're looking at, and then the tools as the very last consideration to match up with those pre previous things that we've put a lot of thought into. And thinking differently, teaching differently involves um, really being supported from the top down to be creative and to try things differently, which might fail. And if you're an administrator who's here, I want you to ask yourself, 
what was the last thing that I did to actively encourage teachers to try something that might fail, knowing I might walk in the room? And that's a really difficult thing on both sides. All right, you can go on, Marcy. I can talk about that slide all day. <laughs> so we talk about specially designed instruction and UDL. There's some similarities and people kind of think, oh, it's all about special ed. And, and it's not at all. They're very different in some, in some very specific ways. So when we're talking about universal design for learning. We're talking about um, things, designing things from the ground up to be as accessible as possible to the widest range of people possible. So we're talking about like putting curb cuts in the sidewalk. So those curb cuts are there, whether you have to use them, whether you are required to use them if you're in a wheelchair, for example, or whether you just want to use them because you just had a knee surgery or you just had, or you're dragging a suitcase. Uh, and it's easier to walk up that curb cut than it is to step up on the curb or pull your suitcase up on the curb. That's a universally designed feature. Um, when we take that to the classroom, we, we put an L on the end and that's the learning, the universal design for learning. And so it's the, it's the physical space. Do students have choice and, and flexibility in the physical space and how they sit, where they sit, if they sit at all, what it looks like and feels like in the classroom, how the information is presented to them, how they're able to respond to that. And the level of choice and flexibility that's built into that environment is universal design. So it's designed without any kid's face in mind. Before you know a single student's name or have seen a single student's face, we've designed things to be as accessible as possible possible from the ground up, which is very different from SDI. And I'll let you talk about that one, Marcy. All right. So when we're talking about specially designed instruction, we're talking about designing for a specific individual. So we have our students with disabilities. We're looking at their present levels of performance and where they're at now. And we're creating goals of where we want them to be at the end of that school year. And that specially designed instruction is what are we going to do? What is the teacher going to do and instruct on so that the student can get from their present levels to their goals. What are those services and supports that are needed? And it's all around that specific individual. We're looking at their disability. We're looking at their ability. We're trying to figure out what is going to best serve their needs in order to get them from one place to the next place over time. And you're planning specifically for that individual. So it's definitely more reactive as opposed to proactive. You're looking at their skill levels and you are saying, okay, this student is here. Here are the services and supports we need to put in place in order to have them reach their goals. Whereas universal design for learning is looking at all, as Daniel said, it's looking at all of those students and planning for them before they even enter the door and who could come in that door tomorrow. So that's the difference. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into specially designed instruction later within the presentation, um, telling you more about, okay, I think I'm doing it. You know, there's some types of specially designed instruction. What can that look like? And then even more so into kind of a checklist or a barometer to know, is this really SDI? Is it not? So we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. So you can kind of gauge your services that you're providing now to see if you are providing specially designed instruction, because specially designed instruction is what makes special education special. If a student is eligible, they must be receiving specially designed instruction. They need that instruction in order to learn. And so that is a special educator's role and that case conference committee's role to determine what instruction is needed and to ensure that it's taking place over time. One more little point about that is that, you know, people will say or have said for a few years now that, you know, if we really implement universal design for learning well, then there's no need for specially designed instruction or for assistive technology or accessible materials. And I, and I strongly disagree with that. A perfectly implemented, universally designed environment certainly might reduce the need for some specially designed instruction or some assistive technology, but it's never going to completely re eliminate that need. So this slide has a cartoon uh, on it. And it's got a man shoveling snow off some stairs and a bunch of students waiting to, to get up the stairs and one student in a wheelchair waiting to get up a ramp that's been added on to the, to the stairs, it looks like. And the, um, the student in the wheelchair says, could you please shovel the ramp? And the, uh, the adult shoveling the stairs says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. 
And the kid in the wheelchair says again, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. And so I like to use, and by the way, I want to point out what I just did. I almost forgot. So I didn't just say, hey, look at this cartoon and read it for yourself because I don't know who's here. You may not be able to see what's on the screen. You may not be able to read what's on the screen. You may be reading in a different language. I don't know necessarily all of you. And so Putting that on the screen, giving it to you visually, but also giving it to you auditorily, also giving it through to you through captions is a modeling of, of universally designing, presenting information. Um, but I like to talk about the Guggenheim Museum as well, which is a spiral, it has a spiral ramp from the from the ground to the top. And it wasn't built with stairs that we had to add an elevator to later. It was built with a spiral ramp because everybody can get up a ramp. I can walk up a ramp, I can wheel up a ramp, I can cartwheel up a ramp, break dance up a ramp, somersault up a ramp. But if it was steps, there's only one way we can get up steps. So it just makes sense to design things universally from the ground up so that we don't have to do as many things to it later to make it accessible. All right. Well, we will, Daniel, let's go ahead and skip this for now because I think when I converted it to Google Slides, it didn't convert over. Yeah, that's so, fine. We'll, we'll put the link to that in the Padlet. That sounds great. Perfect. Which is okay because you can watch a video anytime on your own time, but you're here to Absolutely. see Marcy do her thing. <laughs> So universal design for learning, I just think this, this quote really kind of sums up what it is, but it really is these three principles based on learning science, sciences, and Daniel's going to dive into the principles more deeply, but they're going to design, they're going to guide that design and development of the curriculum so that it's effective and inclusive for all learners. Absolutely, that's a great quote. So this visual on the screen is showing three uh, diagrams of a human head and three different parts of the brain, which represent the three different parts of universal design for learning. And the point I want to make about this slide without talking about it too extensively is that this is based in brain science. Universal design for learning is based in brain science. And presenting information to students in multiple and flexible ways happens in one part of the, of the brain, is received in one part of the brain. And how a student plays with that in their mind and responds to it in multiple and flexible ways happens in another part of the brain. And how a student decides mm -hmm. whether or not to engage with whatever it is that's going on in that curriculum happens in a third part of the brain. And so these happen in a particular order. Engagement is first, representation is second, and action and expression is third. Um, it used to be, and not many people know this anymore, but when Universal Design for Learning was first being presented from the Center for Applied Special Technologies, uh, engagement was the last bullet point. And people started to think, well, why shouldn't that be the first bullet point? And, and, and of course, it should be the first bullet point, because if, if your learners aren't engaged with what's going on, the other two bullet points don't really matter, but they are related. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the engagement bullet point was moved to the front several years ago because it is the most crucial first step. Um, but I want to talk a little bit just before we go on to the next slide with, with just a little second here about representation and action and expression. So, for example, if you can't read or if you're blind or if you can't hear and something is being presented in only one mode and it's not the mode that you can perceive in, of course you're not gonna be in, engaged. Or if it's presented in a way and, and you're asked to respond in a way that you just can't or, or don't like to, you're also not gonna be engaged. So one little quick story about myself there is that I grew up doing just fine in school but hating to hand write with pencil on paper really despising it. And so I wrote as little as possible. My handwriting was and still is absolutely horrendous. And I lost all kinds of points because teachers couldn't read what I wrote because my handwriting was so bad. Uh, you know, it might, there's so much emphasis placed on cursive writing. He's got to practice at home and, and he's so shy and quiet. He doesn't raise his hand to talk in class. We think he knows the answers. And so I just look back at all those comments from my teachers growing up and I think how completely irrelevant to my success as a professional adult, because I speak for a living. I haven't handwritten a darn thing for a professional reason in probably 25 years now. 
Um, the exception to that is my signature, which isn't even actual letters, it's a scribble. And everything else is typed either with my fingers or with my voice. And so I think the things that were so relevant and important to my teachers are completely irrelevant to my success as an adult. And I just wonder how many times have I done something similar to students, made something important yeah. because it was important to me and it should be important to them that really doesn't have any relevancy to, to their success and, and independence as an adult. Um, so those three <clears throat> bullet points there are closely tied together, even though they do happen in different parts of the brain. And so Fast forwarding, I've, you know, I realized that what I, what I despise is the sound and feel of uh, a wooden pencil on paper. Um, and I can't explain it. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I just hate the way it sounds. I hate the way it feels like somebody, you know, some people hate fingernails on chalkboard or fingernails on cardboard or styrofoam. It's kind of like that for me. I just hate the sound and feel of it. So all it would have taken was for my teacher to say, hey, give me that pencil. Here's a pen. Here's a keyboard. Here's shaving cream. Here's a crayon. Here's a marker. You know, so many different ways if they really wanted to know what was going on in here to get it out. Okay, you can go on, Mercy. So customizing opportunities for success and recognizing our students' uh, internal and, and external strengths, weaknesses, and needs. Um, and these are like those, all those little dots. I like that graphic that Marcy showed. Everybody brings their, their own strengths and, and needs and weaknesses and, and opportunities and interests and, um, uh, and passions to, to a learning environment. And we, if the more we can design those learning environments and our instruction, our strategies to, to maximize the individuality that students bring to those environments, um, the better we'll be. And I think not only for students. So if you're here as an administrator, I like to always ask the question, what was the last thing you did to model universal design for learning for your staff? Not just tell them to do it, but how did you show them that it's important to you? And so for example, whenever I have a staff meeting, whether it's in-person or virtual, we always have a virtual option. So people who can't be there in person can be there virtually. And we've been doing that for since 2008, I think. So that's not new. But I also always have another way for them to respond because it's not always easy for a student or a staff member to speak out in a group setting. And we, we all know that there's some students and some staff who are really good at that and they tend to dominate the time and, and the opportunities. But if I always give my, my staff a Padlet, for example. So if there's something you want to contribute to this, but you don't want to speak and do it during the meeting, you don't want to take the time, or you don't even want to have your name associated with it, you want it to be anonymous, you can do it through Padlet. And the more of that feedback I get, even if it's stuff I don't necessarily enjoy hearing, the better I can become next time. Um, so, you know, case conferences, parent-teacher conferences, staff meetings, make, make materials accessible both digitally and, and uh, paper-based and auditorily whenever you can, offer options for attendance and options for interaction. Okay. So we don't know about you guys as a learner, and we've tried to do things here as universally designed as we can offering things in multiple ways to both provide you with information, but also for you to, to respond to us. So I mentioned the Zoom hands and the Q&A, but also the chat window. Um, but we want you to, to raise your Zoom hand, which should be in your toolbar, which I think is at the bottom of everybody's Zoom screen. It might be at the top, depending on what device you're on. But raise your Zoom hand if you have students who strictly learn best by watching. I see one. How about by reading? Looks like zero. How about, do you have students who strictly learn best by hearing information? There's one. How about strictly learn best by, uh, by doing, by doing things, hands-on? There's one. How about to raise your Zoom hand if your students strictly learn best through multiple modalities? <laughs> I knew we were amongst friends. 
Yeah, cool. And so I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this slide, but I do want to mention this thing called learning styles that you might have heard about. And, uh, you know, it's been a big thing and there's been a whole lot of money spent on learning styles. And it's a that's a really dangerous thing. And there's actually no research supporting learning styles the way it's presented. Um, and the problem with the big problem with it is that we don't just learn best by one modality all the time. And by doing a learning styles inventory and, and saying, oh yeah, that student's an auditory learner, that student's a visual learner, and we always present that way to that person, takes away the whole concept of multiple modalities. And I may want to learn something based on the content, the difficulty of it, the newness to me, um, how I'm feeling that day, the other things I have to do that day by reading it, the next day, or, or the different content, I may want to learn it best by reading it with my ears. The next day, I may have to just be involved in it. And it's going to depend on the task too, right? So I do a lot of motorcycle maintenance. And it's really hard to describe to somebody how to fix or how to install a new piston in a two-stroke motor through text by letting them read it. They've got to try it and do things and, and feel it and pos possibly mess it up a couple of times uh, to really learn how to do it. All right, anything you want to add on that one, Marcy? No, I just think um, when we talk about students and we talk about universal design for learning, and I think you're going to get here, but it's really teaching students to identify what types of activities that they're able to learn best by doing each of these things. So um, how do we teach them to become expert learners so that they know, oh, in this case, watching might be best for me. In this case, I might need to listen to the information or have you walk me through it and model it for me. So it's really helping our students understand. We had that slide of, of as you as learners, which you really didn't get to explore too often, but think about the way that you learn best over different activities as Daniel was giving examples for. And then think about how do we teach students to understand that about their own learning? And that's what's so important about universal design for learning. It's giving them multiple options and most multiple access points so they can determine, yes, this is what works for me. Or that was really hard because it wasn't presented this way. And how do we let them communicate that with their teachers who are working with them? Yeah, and uh, Alana put in a really good comment. If I'm tired, I will not learn as well. Hearing the material, I need to read it myself. Absolutely mm -hmm. valid. And I'm actually the opposite. So I'm really tired. I don't learn best by reading it with my eyes. I learn best by reading it with my ears. Um, and it varies from time to time and task to task and, and time of the day. Teaching them to advocate for their learning needs. Yes, but also, Jessica, I'll add on to that, that we talk a lot about self-advocacy for students, but that's something that doesn't just happen. Like just saying, hey, advocate for yourself does it. And it's a really hard thing to do to advocate for yourself because it's basically saying, hey, I'm different. I don't understand this. I need help. I need it in a different way, which not only students, adults are really, really hesitant to do. And we know that because the adults with disabilities who go on to post K-12 education drop out at a tremendous rate. And the ones who do stay don't ever disclose or they disclose at a very low percentage. It's like it's like 7% that, that they have a disability at the college level. And these are highly uh, intelligent um, students who have gotten through K-12 education seemingly just fine to go on to the college environment. So that's a really thing, hard thing to do, um, teaching students to advocate for themselves. And so something that we can do as teachers is to just constantly encourage trying things in new ways, which in one sense yes. is encouraging students to take a leap that might land them flat on their face and, and embracing failure as an opportunity to learn. So like I, like I said, putting a new piston in a two-stroke motor, you're probably gonna screw that up a couple of times, but that's how you truly learn to do it right and how to do it and like hold this and which tools to do, to do it right for you, which may not be the same way to do it right for me. All right. So intentional customized design. So this doesn't just happen by accident. Um, once in a while, maybe it might happen by accident, but for the most part, this is very intentional, um, which implies the word designed, which takes time and it takes, it takes planning ahead of time. And it involves things like, like the classroom environment itself, the physical space, ways to engage students, options for presenting information to your learners, and allowing them flexibility in how they show you what they know. So, so in the environment, there's, there's a lot of things to think about, and I encourage 
people to think about um, your senses. So your five senses and what kinds of things might be coming into those five senses for students, whether all five senses are there for all of your students or not. And so, you know, how is how are things perceived visually? How are they perceived through touch? Um, how are how what are the smells? What do the lights look like? What is what kinds of sounds are going on? Um, and there's a lot of sounds in most classrooms that most of us tend to tune out. But I've had lots of students who. Um, are just super sensitive to the sound of that fan motor or that blower or the, the, the fluorescent lights in a space or that one teacher down the hall or across the classroom that they had last year that they just can't stand and all they can hear is that teacher's voice all the time. So lots of different things we can do there, but keep in mind all of those ways to perceive the information that's happening. All right, so the environment itself, this is just one example, and I didn't think of it till just now, but I'll put on the Padlet a link to a, um, it's kind of a three-dimensional immersive space that you can look around. It's a classroom that Patton's put together um, to kind of represent what a universal design, universally designed classroom could look like. I'll put that link under the UDL column on the Padlet, but I want you to look at this classroom too and think about some things that you see um, and there are some big windows in the back, three big windows, it looks like, and toward the foreground, there's two circular tables. One of the circular tables has um, uh, therapy balls or exercise balls that are in sort of a base that holds them still. The other circular table has like two different types of chairs. One's kind of like a plastic lounger. The other two look like they might be sort of like camping chairs made out of some canvas material. In the middle of the room, there's uh, like a coffee table style uh, table with two benches on either side of it. Um, there's a couch toward the windows in the back of the room. And then there's a traditional like table with plastic traditional chairs toward the left hand back side of the room. Um, but I just kind of want you to put your thoughts into the chat window or into the Q&A box, either way about what this environment looks like and feels like and is perceived by you, some things that, that are universally designed, some things that could be better. Lana says, helps with sensory if needed to sit on the ball chairs. Sure, it could be sensory, but it could also just be that need to move. And we've got a lot of students and there's also a lot of adults who just need to move every now and then. And so in my classroom, um, and again, it was, it was K through six, I brought in my own therapy ball and I put it there and I had students who wanted to use it, but I had students and did use it, but I had other students, smaller students who had trouble just, you know, with mobility in general and sitting on the ball is just a recipe for disaster because it would constantly falling off. So all I did was take some PVC, some big, I think like three or four inch PVC and I made a square box. So four straight pieces and four elbows and made a little box, set it on the floor, put the therapy ball in that, which is kind of what they've done in this picture with the stands that those balls are in that kept it uh, from rolling around. Uh, let's see, John says, builds advocacy, students understand their needs and can act to meet them. Also gives teachers options to guide students. Yeah, there's a lot of options in, in here. A lot of different spaces. So it's not like one space for everybody sitting in rows, facing the front, putting up their hand to talk. Lots of separate spaces. And it's, it's often much easier to interact when you're in a small group than when you're in a larger group. Uh, different ways for kids to move, depending on their needs. Absolutely, Jessica, and it might change from day to day. So today I might want to sit at that ball. Tomorrow I might want to sit at the coffee table. Um, Rachel says it looks welcoming. Better with the dining classroom when there are different seats. Sensory input, variety of chairs. Oh yeah, Marcy's got a good point. Consider lighting. So with those three big windows, yeah, we could turn off the, uh, the overhead lights potentially. couple of standing desks in there as well. Yeah, Dustin, good point. And so um, one thing I really like <clears throat> is not just the standing desks, but 
I can't think of their actual name right now, but they're, they're bicycle desks. So it's like a stationary bicycle, but there's a desk as well. Um, and so I've seen this used in multiple classrooms and my, my wife actually had one or she had three in the back of her classroom and one in the front of her classroom as a high school biology teacher. And, um, it was incredible. Like, so students would just come in and some days they'd want to use the bicycles and move their legs while they work. Other days they would want to sit at a regular desk and they had that choice every day. Uh, Jessica has one. Yeah, cool. Very cool. All right. Back to menti.com. And you should still be able to use the same tab that you had open before, right, Marcy? Correct. Same code. Sorry, my buttons not able to escape. All right, so go ahead and write in ways that you are currently engaging your students. And if you aren't currently in the classroom, how did you in your previous positions or um, what are some ways that you can engage students differently within the classroom? <clears throat> this, I think, is the hardest of the three bullet points, by the way. Nice. The relationship. Yeah, the other two bullet points tend to be a little more concrete in nature. We can we can experience them, see them, hear them, feel them. And this is a little more abstract most of the time. Giving them choices. I like that one a lot. And so even though I said this one tends to be the hardest bullet point, most difficult, I think that one tends to giving them choices tends to be always always valid. And so the example I like to use is, you know, if you, if you say, hey, everybody turn to your social studies, uh, page 37 in your social studies textbook, versus saying, you can turn to page 37 in your social studies textbook, or you can go to this link, you can, or you can scan this QR code, or you can come over here and talk to me personally. Um, just giving that choice, even though it's the same content, is already more engaging. Capitalize on their interests, provide choices and multiple ways of accessing, introduce a unit with a bag of things. A bag of things is always fun. Have them guess what the topic might be. That's super engaging. I like that a lot. These areas of my classroom where kids could take breaks as needed. I, pro I provided picture schedules with our objectives for students who needed them. And this is anonymous, so I'm not going to call anybody out if you don't want to talk. You don't, you don't have to share anything. But uh, I like that concept of giving breaks as needed a lot. And it's going to vary by student and by classroom, of course. But one thing about breaks is that if you tell somebody what to do during their break, it's not really a break. <laughs> and so like, if we give you guys, we're not giving you a break because it's not that long this morning, but if we did give you a break and we told you, you've got these three things to do during your break, it's not really a break. And I see students doing that with kids all the time and then saying, well, it doesn't help when I give them a break. No, you didn't really give them a break. Use of choice for seating and own presentation on style. Yep. Link their learning to other areas. Yeah, it doesn't have to just be biology. It can also be a reading <clears throat> and math class at the very same time where you can talk about what they're doing in this other teacher's classroom, the things they're doing, and help them with their project while you're still working on biology. Picture puzzles. Cool. When the students are really into a topic. Use that within the lesson. Yeah. Yep. And you don't always have to, because um, it can get overwhelming. I mean, I've had students where all they want to talk about is sharks, which is cool. But when all they want to talk about is sharks, and I really want to do this other <laughs> thing, and or maybe I'm just tired of sharks for a while, then I can change the sharks thing to um, a, a reward, a reinforcement. Peer teaching, yes. 
And I'll add on to that, whomever put peer teaching in there, um, also allowing and encouraging and, and setting up situations where the student gets to be the expert. So even if it's something that you're already really good at, pretending that you're not and saying, hey, let's let's learn this together. I've noticed you're pretty good at this part of um, a computer or this, this particular website. Maybe you can help me figure out how to do a video about this. Letting a student teach you or pretend to teach you, pretend you pretend to learn something from a student is incredibly empowering. Use games. Wait a minute, games sounds like fun. Are you <laughs> sure you're allowed to have fun in a K-12 classroom? I haven't said this for a while, but I used to say in almost every presentation I gave that the side effect of having fun is learning. I don't think it's possible to not learn something while you're having fun. And it, that's, you know, with everything, not just educationally, but I don't think it's possible to not learn something, to internalize something and be able to apply it to something else while you're having fun. And so for some reason in the United States in K-12 education, we've gotten away from this idea of fun in the classroom. It's gotta be, it's gotta be driven and standards-based and, and it does have to be standards-based for the most part, but it can also be fun. So I like that, use games, picture puzzles. Science was very active with many short and ongoing investigations. I don't even know who you are or what you teach, but I'm already engaged because you said <laughs> active short and investigations. That sounds like a blast. Awesome. Thanks for putting all that stuff in there. That's good stuff. And so that is really what we're talking about when we talk about the affective network. And that's that one part of the brain that has to do with engagement, you know, how we feel about it, why we decide we should be engaged with it. And fun is absolutely a big part of that. Interest, something I'm already interested in, is a big part of that. Something I want to be more involved with is a big part of that. Something that I know my friends are involved with, but I don't really know anything about it yet, could be a big part of it. Um, yeah, anything else you want to add there, Marcy? No, I think you covered that. So a couple of things there um, that we really pointed out we are doing today is, is closed captioning, um, which it can be done in a very formal way like we're doing now. Um, a live person captioning, which tends to be the most accurate and best way of doing it, uh, but not always available, especially for a classroom teacher. But a couple of things that you can do is turn on the closed captioning in Google Slides, which takes literally one, two, maybe three clicks and uh, is free and is pretty good. Not as good as what we have right now with a live person doing it, but pretty good, <laughs> better than nothing. It's also built into Zoom. So you can turn on the closed captions options that's built into Zoom, also free, takes one or two clicks. Um, and then captioning and, and translate. So Google Translate is kind of another addition to that, which is a free way to translate from one language to another. It can happen on the fly. The link is in there. I know it's I know it's way too long for you to be able to look at that and type it in. So what we'll do is put that link into uh, the the Padlet as well for you. But if you haven't played with that, I think it's it is limited to five thousand characters at a time, which is a lot. Um, but it's not gonna go on forever. So when you get to 5,000, you may have to export it if you wanna keep it and then reset it. But it can go from one language to another, back and forth, uh, and happens on the fly. So it's not perfect, but again, better than nothing. And if you're somebody who speaks Spanish and you've come to a case conference and everybody there speaks English, of course, you're not gonna be engaged. Same for our students in the classroom. So a few more things that several of you already mentioned, which is <clears throat> awesome for encouraging engagement, choices and seating. Um, that's a big thing. And for my students, I pretty much left it up to them um, until rules, you know, until, until rules that violated somebody else in some way or another were broken, they had choice. And I worked with students with intense needs. So they may want to sit on the ball today. Tomorrow they want to sit at a standard chair. Maybe for this particular task, they like to just lay on the floor. So unless I'm measuring how long they can sit in a standard chair with 90 degree hips, 90 degree knees and 90 degree ankles, 
And I don't care where they sit or where they lay. I care about the product they're producing and what they're able to show me they can do, which goes right along with their varied methods for response. So if they know they have the option of writing it with a pencil if they want, using a pen, using a keyboard, using their voice, dancing it out, acting it out, they're <laughs> probably already going to be more engaged. Uh, Marcy likes to tap dance everything that I ask her to, sure to show do. Me, you know, which she'll do later for you. <laughs> um, and then options, for, you know, presenting things in multiple ways, of course, like we've talked about, uh, it encourages engagement. Jessica says she's getting on her bike desk now. Awesome. Aren't you a little jealous of that? Because I am. I know. I know, <laughs> I really am. So some guidelines and checkpoints for, for the engaging part, which is the why. Why should they be involved in your lesson? Ask yourself, why is the content relevant to the students? And so that goes back to me as a, as a, as a young, young student. I didn't see any reason why it was important for me to be able to handwrite or to speak in class because I already <clears throat> knew that I knew the content. I didn't feel like I needed to show you that as my teacher. I already knew I knew it and I would just wanted to get on to the next thing that I wanted to do at recess or, or whatever else or what I had going on after school. Why should the content be relevant? Um, is choice built in? Do they have choices? And do they feel safe? So that's a big one. And we've got a lot of students coming from a lot of different situations. Um, that may change on a daily basis. And if you come into a situation and you don't feel safe, you're far less likely to engage in what's going on because you're worried about your own safety. And I've really taught myself that by teaching. I've been teaching, I taught about 20 uh, beginning motorcycle classes over the summer. And students come to that very much afraid sometimes. And unless we can deal with that and get them to a spot where they feel safe, it completely overwhelms everything else that's going on, both mentally and physically. Um, is the work meaningful and valuable to them? Do the students have necessary skills to work through a task? Or is the task so far ahead of them that they're like, uh, yeah, forget this. There's no way I'm engaging with this because I have no idea the last three words she just used, um, which happens a lot. So if you take your car in to get the brakes done and they come out and tell you 10 other things that need to be fixed and they use five terms for parts on your car that you've never heard before, you're checked out. You're not engaged in that anymore. Same thing for our students. If you're using vocabulary and terminology that they're not already familiar with, they've already checked out. So keep that in, as an important part of designing your lessons universally uh, from the ground up. Think about the vocabulary and the terminology that's going to be used and make sure that all students have an understanding before you get into the actual content. And do you have high expectations? Are the high expectations already there? Or do you all think going into a lesson, oh, the students are already not going to get this or I'm going to do this at a much lower level? Give them ways to respond in, in, in multiple and varied formats and keep that expectation high. And what I tell teachers is don't set a cap on what you think a student's capable of doing until you've tried five different ways for them to show you what they know, which is a lot. And that's a lot of work. And I know it's, I know it's asking a lot, so I, but I have high expectations for everybody as well. <laughs> five different ways. And you're not going to be able to do that with every kid every time. But this one student, you're like, ah, oh, just, he's just not getting it. She's just not, she's just not with me. How many different ways have I tried for him or her to show me what, what they're capable of doing? Um, and if it's not five, try some more. And if you can't think of any more, reach out to me, reach out to Marcy, uh, reach out to one of the other urns and say, hey, I just, I'm struggling. Can you give me some ideas? Mm -hmm. All right couple of tools. And like I said, the tools are kind of the last thing to think about after you've thought about all the other, the, the environment and the student and the task that you're working on. But the tools are important nonetheless. And so some good ones here are Vokey, uh, Apple Clips, iMovie that's built in, or if you're on a PC, it's a movie maker that's built in, no extra costs there. Apple Clips is free too, by the way, so is Vokey. And make connections within your community, especially the smaller rural schools. There's some really powerful uh, community connections happening. Anytime you can bring somebody in, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen farmers come in, they drive their tractor to the school, <laughs> take up like six parking spaces, come in and they talk about things that are involved in farming, which have to do with all parts of the curriculum, of course, uh, but makes it relevant to those students and how they're growing up in the community. <clears throat> they're in, just as one example. And turn it, just turn on captions all the time. Whether you've got somebody there that you know has a hearing impairment or not, 
just get in the habit of always, always having captions on, whether it's a staff meeting, a case conference committee, or in your classroom daily. And I can't, I've lost count of the number of people who've come up to me after a presentation and said, thank you so much for having captions because I have a hearing impairment. I know I came in late and I was stuck in the back of the room and I would have gotten nothing out of that session if you hadn't had the captions on. And these are people that you know didn't put on their form ahead of time, hey, I have a hearing impairment, I need, it's just, it's just people who enjoyed it who or who need it. So I've had people come up and say, um, you know, I, I don't have a hearing impairment, but having the captions there because you talk so fast really helped me out. Um, and, we're big, we're, we're highly focused on literacy at Patton's and that's our, that's our overarching like emphasis and everything that we do. We want to make sure it supports literacy and the greatest predictor of reading growth is time spent reading. And if we've got students that we know can't read for one reason or another, we know for certain they're spending zero time reading. So we know for certain they're making zero growth in reading. So if you turn on the captions, that is essentially providing text to speech, kind of. And it's allowing students to potentially perceive words <laughs> through their ears at the same time they're perceiving them through their eyes, which in my view counts as time spent reading. It provides access to text. It's kind of like reading to a student. Okay. All right, can we skip these minties just because I'm looking at the time? Yep, let's keep it rolling. So if you have anything to add about increasing student engagement, please do so within the chat. We would love to see that, but we can do that while we continue with the presentation. Yeah, you guys have been great with the chat, so let's keep doing that. Any questions at this point around engagement? Okay. So again, in the chat, if you have um, ways that you're currently presenting curriculum or materials to students. We would love to see what you have there. Or to your staff, if you're an administrator, are you already doing some things that are, that are multiple and flexible in nature as far as presenting information to your, to your staff? And I wonder before, before we talk about this next part of the brain, um, as you're thinking about how you present information to your students and or your staff, if you are an administrator, have you ever asked yourself if you have staff who have a disability that they've not disclosed to you? And if you haven't asked yourself that, you should. And really kind of think deeply about it and think about your staff and how they might need or prefer to receive information. Um, and it's, it's not something that's always easy for an adult professional to disclose to their supervisor that, hey, I need something in a, in a digital format so that I can read it with my ears because I can read it with my eyes. It just takes me twice as long. And if you provide something in a way that they're able to process twice as fast or twice as effectively, that's just a win-win for, for everybody. And so we get to this, this concept of the recognition network of the brain, which is a, a second part of the brain, a different part than the affective network. And it's the what, it's the input, it's, it's, it's the how we present information and how students are able to, to best perceive it. All right, you can go ahead, Marcy. So when we talk about the presenting of the content or the what, there's some guidelines and checkpoints to think about. Do students have or do they need relevant background knowledge? And so I talked about that terminology, the, the vocabulary part, um, and, and just the background knowledge, which research says is the most influential factor um, regarding uh, reading achievement, re reading comprehension. And so rather than decoding even or um, anything else, it's the student's background knowledge of whatever the content is. And if they don't have it, that's a huge thing. So I know a teacher who uh, was teaching in Florida and um, close to the beach actually, and assumed, but it was a, it was a relatively poor part of, of the city and made the assumption that because we're only 20, 30 minutes from the beach, that all these students have 
have been to the beach. And so built a lesson around going to the beach and realized very quickly that over three quarters of, of her class had never been to the beach. And so they didn't understand all this terminology and things and feelings and concepts that were going on. And by the same token, are there cultural or language barriers going on? Of course, you're not going to be engaged if you're not able to perceive the meaning uh, because you speak uh, or read or, or perceive a language differently. Um, proper content structure supported, you know, does it have a beginning and an introduction? I like whoever said I introduce a bag of things and I have people try to guess what the concept's going to be. That's awesome. That's a way to get people in, engaged for sure. Um, the themes, big ideas, patterns, generalizations being explained and supported. Absolutely. Sometimes we need to draw those connections for students who aren't able to always make them on their own. And that depends on their background knowledge a lot. And can students customize the way they receive it? And a, and a lot of you, you know, put in the, in the chat and in the mentee that you might want to receive things differently based on how tired you are, based on what the content is, based on your, your existing skill level with that particular thing, um, how new it is to you. All right, we can go on. And so I've mentioned this multiple times in various ways, but I want to address it very explicitly at this point. So when you think about reading, how do you define what reading is? And if you are interested, I encourage, and I'll try to put this on the Padlet wall too, I encourage you to go to the International Literacy Association and look at their definition of reading. And it's very broad and wide and and, and represents a lot of different medium. And so I want you to think about the concept of visual reading, which might be what we think about most often when we've got a piece of paper, we're perceiving it with our eyes, we're assimilating it, we're decoding it and assimilating it with what we already know. So that's visual reading, as opposed to tactile reading, which might be like braille or tactile graphics. Um, you're definitely reading with your fingers or tactilely. And then third, auditory reading. And so this is a, a term and a concept I want you to start using instead of saying things like um, uh, listening to a book, because it's very different to listen to something than to read it auditorily. Just like it's very different for me to look around and see things than to read something visually. Very different skills involved in just hearing something versus reading it auditorily. And in a long session, uh, what I'll do is bring up a Wikipedia article on motorcycle suspension, which is very technically written. And um, unless, you know, once in a while I've had like a motorcycle mechanic in the back of the room and they're like, oh yeah, I know all the answers. What I'll do is have my computer read that auditorily to uh, my audience and then ask them comprehension questions. And these are teachers and administrators and psychologists and really the service people just like yourselves who can't answer a single question. One, because they don't understand, they don't have a background in that particular content. And two, because auditory reading is very difficult and has to be explicitly taught and practiced. Um, and so all three of these potentially can also happen at the same time. Okay, so I saw a lot of um, comments coming in. Anything we need to... Lana, students who are blind. Yep, awesome. Give them something to feel, parts of the flower. Yep, that's awesome. Yeah, so visual reading doesn't have to just do with Braille. It can, it absolutely can be things as well. Mm -hmm. Shows, I like the closed captioning, being able to listen to. Me too, Jessica. And um, <laughs> I think for anybody who says they don't like closed captions and it's distracting, they just haven't tried it long enough because everybody who does use it long enough, maybe because they have to for one reason or another, end up loving it and not being able to turn it back off. Um, and I think that same strategy we have to apply to our students. They may say they don't like that computerized voice on the computer, or they don't like seeing the captions because it's distracting, but they probably just haven't had enough time and encouragement and strategies taught to them to use those tools. So a few, a few things to think about here, use the subtitles we've already talked about in Google or it's, yeah, it's built into PowerPoint too. I almost forgot about that, which is also uh, free if you have PowerPoint, if the captions are built in. Read and write for Google. Um, read and write for Google for educators is free. Uh, Rewordify is a really cool tool that you can put some body of text into Rewordify and have it leveled uh, to a different level of reading. Videos uh, with captions turned on 
use YouTube. So the YouTube automatic captions aren't perfect, but they're pretty good. They've gotten really good in the last couple of years. Um, classroom amplification system. So if you're looking to spend money and you're not quite sure what to spend it on, ask us. Um, but if you just need to spend it like today and have no time to ask anybody, spend it on classroom amplification system because that benefits students who have a hearing impairment, but it also benefits every student in that classroom. And there is overwhelming research supporting that. All right, you can go on, Marcy. All right, again, we're going to skip this one, but from those examples, if you have other ideas to provide multiple means of representation, please add those to the chat. And any questions that you might have. And how you're measuring students' skill acquisition. Please add that to the chat. Yeah, how do you know? How do you know if a student's with you or not or what their level of understanding is? So this has to do with that third part of the brain, the strategic network or, or the output, how a student is able to demonstrate for you that they have an understanding, um, which is the only way we know, because we say, you know, we write goals a lot of times, students will understand this, understand that, well, really, how do you know? So a better way to write something like that would be a student will be able to demonstrate by doing blank, blank, blank. Katie says, I like to use thumbs up, thumbs down, and a whole group instruction. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh oh. So one thing that I do, um, particularly in a group of adults, um, and particularly in a group of adults who maybe aren't as comfortable speaking, um, like a group of new motorcyclists, for example, sometimes, is they'll be in groups at tables and I'll just have something on the table that is just kind of a meaningless object that nobody else knows the meaning of. And I'll just kind of walk over and say, hey, when you guys are, or when you're ready to move on, when you finish this, I just want you to move this object from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. And I just watch for that. And nobody else knows what it means. Or I say, hey, if you don't understand this, all you got to do is, is move this pink ruler from the, the thing that it's in and, and play with it for a second and set it on the table. And I know that, okay, like the student hasn't had to take a risk and say, hey, I don't understand this at all. They, but they have told me that without being, without, uh, without being embarrassed. All right. Some guidelines and checkpoints there. Are the necessary tools available for physical access and response? So when we think about allowing students to interact with the content and play with it in their minds and respond to it, we got to think about it in two ways, so physical access and cognitive access. So physical access is a little bit easier most of the time because, again, we, it, it's concrete. We can experience it. Are they able to to, to see it or hear it or, or turn the page or move something? Are they able to use the keyboard? Are they able to use the mouse? And if they're not able to do any of those things, we can figure out pretty, pretty concrete ways for them to access the content. Um, but it does take deliberate planning and, and, and ad addressing those, those situations. But then the cognitive part of that's a little more difficult. So if you've got an eighth grader who's reading on a first grade level, how do you present the same content, which you're supposed to do, to that eighth grader who's reading on a first grade level? And so and how do you allow them to respond then as well? So a tool like word prediction might help, whether maybe they got the concept, they, they have all these thoughts they want to get out, but they can't, maybe they can't phonetically decode on grade level yet, so they can't spell on grade level yet, so they can't write on grade level yet. So a tool like word prediction can allow them to get their thoughts out. Um, in a way that allows you to know what's going on in there. And word prediction, by the way, is the one tool that changed my mind from being anti-technology to being complete supporter of assistive technology. It changed my students' lives completely because they were able to write, get their thoughts out, which allowed them to leave my classroom, go into general ed settings, write, compose things, interact with word prediction, which allowed them to make friends in those classrooms, have friends on the playground, friend in the cafeteria, get invited to birthday parties on the weekend. I'm not exaggerating when I say word prediction literally changed the lives of every one of my students. <clears throat> All right, do they have choice in the way that they respond? Maybe different today and tomorrow. Um, and do they have the executive functioning uh, skills necessary to, to support whatever you're asking them to do? 
Are they able to set goals and, and keep lists and make plans and manage and structure information that makes sense to them? And so it may not be a, a anything more than that. A little bit of help providing that set of organization and executive functioning skills might be all they need. A few tools here listed to help with those sorts of things. So executive functioning on the right, things like using Google Keep, which is awesome. And you can share a note with a student and you can make it check boxes. So you can, you can create the note the first few times with, hey, you got to do these things in order. As you go through, check them off. We share this note. So as you check them off, I can see them being checked off. Uh, and then later, you know, fading away, creating, uh, like encouraging the student to create their own checklists. Um, Mercury Reader, Poplet, Read, Write, Think, and then for allowing students to show you what they know. You know, get way outside the box. Allow them to create a comic strip, perhaps. Allow them to use things like, um, like social media, or even if you've got an internal social media that you can use. Alana provided several examples in the chat that she used with her students. So allowing them to tell in ways that they were able. So write, tell other students, tell me. Um, switches, pointing to correct answers, choices, pairing answers with pictures, using their device if they had one. Awesome. I want to be in your class. <laughs> so this is an example of Clips, which is an app from uh, an Apple app. It's free for Apple devices. It doesn't work for other devices, of course. But what I like about it is it has um, captions built in and you can use it and you can allow students to use it. Will that one play, Marcy? I think so. Cool. Hi, my name is Nola Thompson. Today, our thing is division. Our division problem is 9 divided by 3. 9 minus 3 equals 6. 6 minus 3 equals 3. 3 minus 3 equals 0. How many times did you subtract 3? 3 times. So 9 divided by 3 equals 3. We got it. So, so that student just used her device, whether it was an a iPod Touch or an iPhone or an iPad, whatever it was, and clearly showed that she had a strong understanding of that mathematical concept. Absolutely. Without a worksheet. All right, so thinking of other ways that we can measure what students know, um, just providing those options. So as Daniel was saying, that student was able to show just um, within a video recording of how they know, but just because we have a content that we want students to show us what they know, they don't have to write that five paragraph essay to show us their understanding. That video example was a great way. Um, there are other ways where they can just let another student know. I was in a math classroom last week um, observing a co-taught classroom and the amount of conversation that was taking place around math concepts and explaining why they got the answers they did and noting that there could be different processes to get to the same answer was amazing. And it was modeled by the teachers so that the students were able to then take that information that the teachers were modeling and convey it in their own way. So it was really interesting to see the modeling process and then students being able to do it. And you could tell it was something that takes place on a daily basis, not something that I was just in there for that single day to watch the good instruction and the good modeling taking place. But students had um, thorough understanding of the math concepts and that was evident in the way that they were sharing with one another what they knew. Um, and it was a class with varying skill levels, varying disabilities and abilities within the classroom that were shown, but definitely a focus on what students can do, not what students are unable to do within the classroom. So we talked about universal design for learning and we have universal design for learning in place. Um, like Daniel said, there's a lot less that we have to retrofit to meet the needs of our students. But there are still going to be some things that we need to do for our students with disabilities. And that is that specially designed instruction piece. So within Article 7, it is defined as adapting the content, methodology, or delivery of instruction to address the unique needs of the child that results from a child's disability and to ensure that they have access to the general curriculum. 
So to the curriculum that is taught to their peers, they have access to it. And this is the specially designed instruction piece that again, makes special education special for that student. So when we think specially designed instruction, it has to gauge the needs of our students. And students with and without disabilities have needs in all of these areas. They might have academic needs, they might have organizational needs, behavioral needs, social emotional needs, needs around communication, functional needs, physical motor needs, as Daniel mentioned earlier, sensory needs, vocational needs, and technological needs. All of these areas or domains, and even more that may not be listed here, have to be recognized as potential areas that we need to provide direct instruction for, for our students to reach their goals. So if they have a deficit area in reading, then we would write a reading goal and we would have specially designed instruction aligned to that. If they have a deficit area in one of these other areas, like if they need assistive technology, we need direct instruction design to teach them how to utilize that technology to better serve them within the classroom and to gain access to their goals. Uh, you can't just hand a student an iPad and consider it, okay, now you have the tool, go ahead and use it. We need to teach them to the tool, teach how to utilize that tool to better serve them in that educational environment. So all of these can be possible areas for specially designed instruction. Any need can have instruction that coincides with it to lead towards the goal. So the types of SDI that we have, there are four types. There are packages or programs. I'm sure many of you are aware of, such as the Orton Gillingham series, Wilson Reading, Read 180, Touch Map, all of these programs that are readily available. And these programs are evidence-based around the specific learning disabilities or the areas of need for students. And you would wanna look at that evidence base behind. And oftentimes the evidence base is on um, a specific time spent in each of these programs. Um, and we need to make sure that we are doing the programs with fidelity for the evidence to be reliable. So if we say that a student is gonna be in Read 180 and they're supposed to be in it five days a week for 60 minutes of time or whatever that evidence base is around that, and we need to ensure that that is taking place. If a student is only participating in 30 minutes a day, then we can't expect the gains to be the same as a student who is participating 60 minutes a day. So the programs have to be done as they were intended with fidelity in order for the data that we're reaping from those programs to be beneficial. So programs and packages is one type of specially designed instruction. But that's not the end all be all. There are other types of specially designed instruction. So simply using instructional techniques or strategies. And these are examples, many of which Daniel had already talked about when we're designing universally, but providing students different learning strategies, providing visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile instruction, and integrated practices. You can pause during instruction, and integrate that wait time, have clear task analysis, breaking down larger tax, task into smaller sections, and then always providing those short, concise directions for students, sometimes tagging along visuals if needed. Um, again, that's not an, exact, an exhaustive list of integrated practices, just some examples that might be helpful when you're planning out specially designed instruction for students. And the last one is increased instructional intensity. So they have more practice, more steps, more time to review the content that's being placed on them. So these are the four things or the four ways that teachers can provide this instruction that can support the needs of our learners with disabilities. And that is required by law in order to make that special education. So how do we know what we're doing as SDI? We know it can fall under those four types and can be supported by some of those examples, but it has to be aligned with our present levels of performance. And it is specifically designed to address the goals within the student's IEPs. It is research or evidence-based, and it's research or evidence-based based on that student's disability. It's teacher-led. Notice this doesn't say special education teacher-led. So maybe the special educator and the case conference committee is working on planning what specially designed instruction is best for that student, but that can be conveyed to a general education teacher who can provide that instruction as well. Here's the important part. It's systematic. It is planned based on the data that we have. It's delivered over time, we're documenting it, and we're evaluating it. We're progress monitoring to see if students are successful by providing the instruction that we're doing. Um, as Daniel spoke about earlier, many of the concepts and ways that students were able to be engaged in the information, um, ways that the content was represented to them and ways that they were able to show what they know, that action expression piece, 
some of that can fall under specially designed instruction, but we can't just do it on a random basis. It has to be systematic and delivered over time and documented. We need to be sure that we are documenting what we're doing to provide that instruction to students. Um, it's needed by the student with a disability. Again, if they are eligible for services, there has to be some specially designed instruction provided to that student. So what does that look like? And it's based on those deficit areas in order to help them reach those grade level standards. And we have to focus on that skill transfer and maintenance. So if they're in a resource type setting or if they're in um, more of a functional skills or self-contained program, if they can do it in that setting, are we working on them being able to transfer that to different situations, different areas in order to um, be able to show those skills over time, not just in the set setting that we are teaching and instructing in. So what does that look like? If we're looking at all of these points and we can say, yep, that's happening. Yes, that's happening. Then specially designed instruction is happening. What is the teacher going to do? Um, I will tell you in the Padlet, there's a specially designed checklist available for you to utilize that you can kind of go through as you're having conversations of here's where students are, here's where we want them to be, here's what we need to provide to them. It has a checklist where you can go through and kind of check those things off as you go through. The other thing that we have to provide to students are accommodations and modifications. So accommodations is changing the how, how students are accessing the content, whereas the modifications are changing the what, or changing the co complexity and the learning level of the content that we're providing. Went through that very quickly, but there are other um, resources available to you on the Padlet as well. Any questions around specially designed instruction? There are a couple comments in the chat. Thank you, implementation to fidelity, absolutely. All right, so um, it is 1130. So if you would like to stay on and view this video, we will pull it up. If you have to go, I completely understand. Um, I'm going to go ahead and enter the um, evaluation so that you have that information into the chat. And after I do that, I will pull up this video and we can go ahead and evaluate what's taking place um, for Universal Design for Learning and Specially Designed Instruction. When you type in do the eval, it will come to a drop down list in case you do have to leave us today. Um, go ahead and click that, click the session for today and evaluate the session. I do appreciate it. Okay, so as we show this video, I want you to think about the ways in which the single teacher, so one teacher leading a whole group instruction is meeting the needs of all of her learners within the classroom. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to play this one either. I can do it from my screen. Thank you for your patience with me. Hey, Alana, by the way, I was curious what you teach. We snagged her up. She works for us now. Ah, what did you teach? <laughs> okay, cool. Are you guys with me on this? Can you see it? Yep. Okay, thank you. That is an opinion, but Daniel gets to share his. I'm a word person. I feel great when we're all reading and discussing and writing papers. That feels super comfortable to me, but it's not successful for all my students. So I need to disrupt that for myself. Now, right before we sample it, Mick, tell everybody what is it that you need to be able to do by the end of class today? Okay, here is a job that I need. I need every person in this room to get a plastic cup. Within any single day, you'll have a variety of access points for the content. And I do find that it deepens engagement for gen ed kids, for special education kids, for all different kinds of students, because there's more to do. Like we gotta keep it moving, otherwise it gets really boring. 
So it's trying to find a way where there's something that's video, where there's something that's audio, where there's something that's visual, where there's something that's read. It is about that many paths, many, many paths. Floating around, floating around. Nobody's connected to anybody else. Floating around. We're floating around. Now make one milk protein. One milk protein. I really learned how important it was to introduce more visual cues for my students who are English language learners, where you do an action related to vocabulary um, or related to a concept. We're going to stretch out, stretch out, stretch out. The learning gains that I saw for my ELL learners were so huge when I started to disrupt a purely language-based and word-based um, type of instruction. But what do I want now? Connect. 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 It matters less to me how we arrive somewhere. What matters to me is that a student develops the conceptual understanding around something. Get tiny, get tight, get small. You're a tiny, tight little milk protein. I just saw my students really be able to shine. It was beautiful to watch. Okay. Sometimes I think when we are thinking about what a teacher can do in our classroom and supporting all of those learners, going back to that first picture of this is our reality. We have all these strengths and all these areas for growth. And we think about meeting the needs of all of those students in the classroom. We think we need more people. We think we need more money. We need more resources. But you will notice in that classroom, she did have some <clears throat> individual supporting but for the most part, led some whole group instruction that had multiple access points for all of the learners within that classroom. So if we go back to universal design for learning and we think about engagement, think of how many ways that teacher was able to provide ways for students to become engaged within the content. Think about how she represented the content to the students in multiple ways. And even you saw a little bit of kind of the written type of worksheet that she provided for a student who actually had more of a graphic organizer on it and represent the content in different ways. But they also had the opportunity to get up, move, come together, put those milk proteins together. So, so many different ways for students to access that same information that she was giving. And, and I would argue that probably um, within that, was able to definitely um, reach so many more of the students. And whether it's a student with a learning disability, whether it's a student with more of a cognitive disability, or if we're looking at students with you know, behaviors or anything like that, or even looking at our students who are English language learners or any other at-risk um, learners in the classroom, all of those students needed less support from outside providers because she provided that good high quality tier one instruction. And she was able to do that for all of the students within her classroom. It wasn't retrofitting. It was designed from the beginning to meet the needs of all of the students within the classroom. I think this is such a great example of how to do it um, as a whole group. And she provided many options of how to make that successful. And yes, it's one lesson. Um, and as Daniel will tell you, you can't plan every single lesson universally at the beginning. It's overwhelming. Um, and he's going to go through some resources now about a UDL lesson planner that you can use just to get you in the right mindset of thinking when you're planning. I will pass that on to him. Yeah, so thanks for hanging in there with us. And yes. um, a couple of quick resources for you. Is Patton's has a UDL lesson plan creator that, like Marcy said, is is not something you're going to use for every lesson. It's very comprehensive. It's very in-depth and it's just too much for every lesson to be perfectly honest, but it's a great way to start getting yourself in that mindset of thinking universally. And it walks you through all the different things that you should be thinking about in your lesson. So I would say, take a lesson you already have, have it next to you, have it on your, on your computer desktop and come, come to the universal uh, lesson creator uh, from Patents and have them side by side and just kind of work through it and add things and think about things. And when you're done with it, what it sends you is a Google Doc, your own Google Doc of your lesson that you can go in and make edits to just like you would uh, any other Google Doc. Um, and it's not shared with anybody else. And so 
um, you're able to keep it and kind of make make changes to it and and just do that for I would you know I, I encourage teachers to do it once or twice a year and then you just start thinking along those lines and, and the, the QR code is here but it's also available on the Padlet as well so um, if you capture it here and don't bookmark the link then you can access it via the Padlet. Um, and I mentioned early at the very beginning that the Indiana Center for Accessible Materials or the ICAM is also part of patents. And so the, there are eight specialized formats or accessible formats of, of text, of materials that are required by Indiana. So the first four that are in bold are the federal requirements in IDEA which are braille, large print, digital text, and audio. The next four, Indiana adds to the federal requirements through Article 7, Article 7 rules. And those include captions, video, tactile graphics, and audio descriptions. And so those are the things that are part of Indiana's special ed rules. Um, not something that should just be done if you feel like it or if you have a particular um, affinity for one of those, but those are things that you should be considering for all things all the time. Um, which is kind of overwhelming. So that's why we're here. We're here to help. And a lot of those formats, we can get you uh, to give to your students through the Indiana Center for Accessible Materials uh, at no cost to you. We also do six weeks loans of assistive technology or AT. Uh, we ship it to you. You try it for six weeks, take data on it, implement it with fidelity, and then we send you a shipping label and you ship it back to us. So it truly costs you nothing. Um, and we can provide training too. So you can borrow a device or, or something from us, and then we can come and actually do training with you on that device with your students. A few more UDL tools for delivering and designing instruction. Uh, we mentioned CoWriter, uh, which is word prediction, sound field systems. So we have all these things available to loan out as well. So you don't have to spend money to try it. Um, Let's see, there's one other on here that I, oh, dictation or speech to text. So if you got students who just really struggle with writing, whether it's a fine motor issue or it's, or it's a spelling issue, but they're able to speak pretty clearly, speech to text might be an answer to get them to start composing some things that allow you to see. And if it's not a spelling test or a sentence structure test, if it's just a, I wanna know what's going on in there, if they have the concept, speech to text is a great tool. All right, we'll skip over the video and we'll end with this quote. Go ahead, Daniel. Do your best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, and it's true, like we just things we don't know and we can't know it all at once. But as we do, like Marcy said, don't go try to universally design and specially design everything tomorrow. Pick one little thing that you're already doing and think, how could I represent that one thing that I'm planning to teach tomorrow in two ways instead of just one way? How can I make it visual and auditory and tactile instead of just auditory? And just see how it goes. And then maybe the next next day or the next week, add something else that you wanna do a little bit differently. Make it bite-sized and chunked and, and doable and use us. Reach back out to Marcy, reach back out to us and, and let us help. But try something. Don't leave here and go back to doing exactly what you've always done. Try something, even if it's a small, small thing that you're trying. Because it's okay to fail. Figure out how, why you failed and come back to it, just like we teach our students. All right. I did put that eval link um, also in the tab earlier. But um, if you've hung with us this long, you can go ahead and um, capture it with your QR code and fill it out that way. Daniel's adding some additional resources in the chat for you as well. And then our contact information is here on this slide. Like Daniel said, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out to us. And again, we know you, we kept you a little long today, but we appreciate it. And we hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. Bye.